Good morning, New Life Church. It is so great to be here with all of you today. Like a family, like a family unit. It is so good to be with each and every one of you. When you are able, we would love for you to stand. We're just going to open with prayer. But we are just going to welcome the Lord in today to do whatever he wants to do. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you that you gave us the breath to come and to stand in your presence and to lift you up in one mind and in one accord. And Lord, we stand here humbly before your throne and we just ask if there's anything that would stand in between us and you, Lord, that you would make it known and we would lay it down before you because we want there to be nothing that would stand in the way of miracles, signs, and wonders today. But Lord, we want the miraculous to take place. We want lives to be changed. We want each and every individual here to have an individual touch from the Almighty God and that we walk out and they know that we are your children, that we stand for you. We stand on your word. We love you. We honor you today. And we just ask that you come in. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. 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 Show
Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. Remain standing with me for just a moment if you would. I want to just briefly remind the church. We went through a, a teaching series, preaching series on the church in the book of Ephesians. We talked about the fact that the church was much like the temple, that there's different bricks in a temple and that it's fitly framed together. And in that process of being fitly framed together, we have to connect one to another. And it's built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. And we talked about the fact that if we want to see apostolic ministry, we've got to be connected together. If we want to see the glory of God, we need to be connected together. Because wherever God is, it becomes a beautiful place. Thank the Lord. Amen. That's all right. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and thank Him for it. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. So, um, we're going to start something this upcoming year. And we're going to start some group meetings together. We're going to call them reach groups. And Jeremiah is going to come and explain them to you briefly. And I know you're standing, but it's good for you. And if you need to be seated, that's okay. You can be seated if you need to be seated. But... But I want to remind you of what we said. When we have love one for another, that's what creates the best connection. In other words, it's hard for God to live in a drafty house. It has something to do with the way we connect one to another. Your brother, your sister is very important. And so we, we want to start some fellowship groups that give us that opportunity for connection. So Jeremiah is going to come explain some of it. He'll make announcements and take the offer. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. So I have some of the details concerning the reach groups. They will be, um, there will be many of them. So we have a total of eight groups that through the week, um, other than Sunday, you have the opportunity to be a part of where you can go and connect and um, have fellowship with other people that are um, in like interest and such. So I have, and you may be seated, I have the first one on the list is men's game night. All the men? Okay, all the men? Call out. Amen. All right. There's going to be a men's game night. Um, Brother Brian Kimmer will be in charge of that. And what we do have, by the way, before I continue with the rest, we will have a sign-up sheet out in the vestibule where you will be able, on the welcome desk, where you'll be able to sign up for the um, group, the, the group that you want to be a part of. So please look at those, sign up for it, talk to one of the leaders, and I'll be explaining who the leaders are of each group if you have any questions. And then as the month progresses, I will come back to you with some of the dates that would be going on or these small groups would be on. Amen? So men's game night, Brother Brian Kimmer will be leading that up. Cops, it's caretakers 
of preschoolers, Sister Lynette Hartman, and they will be doing play dates with a purpose. Amen? We're thankful for that. Um, date night. Brother Bruce, Sister Renee Ruggles. They're going to be leading up date night. Um, Spanish Bible study. Brother Armando Trejo and Sister Milvian Gregorio. Amen. I'm excited about that. There's going to be billiards night. Man-to-man -man mentorship, ages 12 and up. Brother Don Hartman is going to be leading that up at the Hartman's place. We're excited about that. Sister Jen with Mama Trauma. And this is going to be a, a group that is um, focusing on motherhood and any trauma surrounding that. There is the In the Loop, which is going to be a how to uh, crochet. I'm saying that correctly, right? Ooh, hey, I got it. <laughs> how to crochet. Um, Sister Ginger Hamill will be leading that group up. If you want to learn how to crochet, she will help you with that. Amen. You can be a part of that group. There will be a New Life Church hyphen, which will be college students plus young adults. Brother Kevin, Sister Jessalyn Castro, raise your hands, please. Big. There we go. We got them. They are going to be leading up that group. Then there's going to be an Ignite group, which is middle school, and the Castros in high school. Uh, the Castros will be doing the middle school, and the high school will be the Roberts, Kyle and Diana. Amen. They're out there. So sorry. I'm so used to you being up here, Sister Diana, but you're sitting there today. That's good. Amen. Thank you so much. So those are the groups. So there are many groups. They are all out there. There are sign-up sheets for you to go out and sign up on. Talk to one of the leaders. If you want to know more about that, please talk to one of the leaders about it, um, what it's going to be about. But we want everyone here to be involved in one of these groups. So we, we have multiple. We have a variety so that everybody can find a place to connect in one of these groups. So please take part in that. Amen. And then I do have an announcement before we take up and receive the tithe and offering. Elements. Who are the Elements students? Raise your hands. Amen. All right. Elements will be starting module three and four next week. Next Sunday, January 15th, we'll start up the next modules, uh, three and four, and we'll go on um, for that for a couple months. So I'm excited about that. If our ushers would please come, we will receive the morning tithe and offering now. We're going to take time to pray over the service, to pray over the offering, that the Lord would have his way. Jesus, we love you today. God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for the church. I want to thank you, God, for the blessings that you put in our lives, Lord, and how you help us, Lord, how you speak to us. And I pray that, Lord, in this service, that today, Lord, we would hear you in the worship. I pray, God, that we would hear you speaking to us in the preaching. That, Lord, we would hear your voice today, that we would be sensitive to it, to hear what you would have to say to us. Lord, we pray your blessing upon the offering, Lord, that, Jesus, it would go forth to your kingdom, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. In Jesus' name. I just believe God wants to do something incredible here this morning. Lord, send a revival. I will keep praying. I will keep fasting until it comes. Send it to every nation. I'll keep believing. I'll keep interceding until it's done.
believe revival. We believe that it's coming. We believe that it will manifest itself in every way needed. We believe that miracle signs and wonders will take place. And we believe that there is power in the name of Jesus to break any stronghold, to break any addiction, to break any generational curse. We believe that there is power in the name above all. In the name of Jesus, we stand and we lift you high, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we say glory to him, glory to his name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He inhabits the praises of his people, which means when you're praising, it means he walks in. It means he's here to meet your need today. Hallelujah. There is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. To break, to break every Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 
to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Yes, 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 Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen. I think it would be good if one more time, listen, as we praise him, certainly scripture says God inhabits the praises of his people. And I don't believe it's just emotionalism that God rewards, but I do believe it's praise. And praise has an expression. Praise means I'm saying something. I'm telling the Lord, thank you, Jesus. And, and I'm involved in the process. Amen. That gives God the opportunity. He works. He breaks chains in that atmosphere. Amen. And there's people that have come in this house today. They've got all sorts of negativity that's just wrapped around them. I believe God wants to break them free from some of that. So let's put a hand in the air or let's speak the name of Jesus for just a moment in this place. Amen. Lord Jesus, you're able. You're able in every place. You're able in every way. You're able, Lord God, to bring deliverance. You're able, Lord Jesus, God, to break through, Lord, negativity and break through, Lord Jesus, any bondage. You're able, Lord God, in every way. You're able to break every chain, Lord God. Pull the darkness, Lord, from someone's mind or someone's emotions, Lord, today. In the name of Jesus, we speak the name of Jesus. We believe, Lord Jesus, you're able, oh God, in every way. We don't have silver or gold, but what we have, we can give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, oh God, give them the ability and the strength today through the power of Lord, that's in your endless life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name that's above every other name, we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Let's keep praying together today. Amen. Jesus, in your name, Lord, you're here. You're here to help us. You're here to touch us. You're here, Lord God, to do the work in our life. I pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Remain standing with me, if you would, for just a moment. I want to read a scripture, and it's, it's kind of a long reading this morning, and so it's out of Philippians chapter 2. I'm starting in verse 19, and it just starts out by saying, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that 
I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come also, come shortly. Yet, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphrodites, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, your messenger, the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost to death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I send him to, or send him more eagerly. And when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may have less sorrow. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness. Of such men hold in esteem because the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. And I, this morning, I want to focus on all of the people that surrounded the Apostle Paul in his earthly ministry. Paul said to the church in Philippi, when you can't care for yourself, God's going to send someone to care for you. How many of you know God will send someone to care for you? He said, when no one else is willing to take a chance on you, God will send you someone who will take a chance on you. How many of you know you need someone to take a chance on you? You need that. Amen. And so Paul said, I don't know how my future is going to turn out as I look forward. I don't know. But he said, I do know that I'm surrounded by God's people. And I do know that God can do great things with people of faith. So today, I'm, I'm just going to, um, I don't know if I'm preaching or teaching or what I'm doing, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to preach a message that's entitled, Facing the Future with Friends. Facing the Future with Friends. Or maybe you could say, Facing the Future with with faithful friends, people that have faith. God's going to send you people that have faith into your life. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you what I told you. But here's, here's what I feel like I'm supposed to tell someone here today. Our world is full of negativity. It's full of negativity. And we can come to church with that negativity in our life, in our mind, in our heart, and I believe God wants that negativity to be broken off of us. I believe God wants to send people to help us. And it's not just about what happens in church on a Sunday morning. It's about God surrounding you with certain individuals. So let's, let's pray that the Lord just has his way today. Amen. Jesus, in your name, God, you know, Lord, how to help us to overcome the challenges that we face. And and Lord, just like the Apostle Paul, when he looked forward, he did not know how things would turn out for him. We don't know. There's many situations people are facing, and they don't know how to move forward. They don't know how to go forward. They don't even know if they can go forward. And Lord Jesus, you're able. You're able to send ministers to them. You're able to use the church body. You're able, Lord God, to breathe through your people and to help us to move forward in those places of life. So have your way today. Do your work in this place today. Use each one of us as members in particular. We'll give you the glory for it. We'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the Apostle Paul was a very unique individual because when he talked about the church, he said the church is very much like a body. And of course, it's the Apostle Paul that said, you know, if, you, if, if the whole body was an eyeball, um, you had a six-foot eyeball walking around when you came to church. Um, he said, what, 
where would the hearing be? In other words, you might come to church and you need someone to listen to what <laughs> is going on in your life, and yet the whole church is just a big eyeball. Uh, he said, that would be foolish. It wouldn't, it wouldn't help anybody uh, because the body is not just made up of one thing. The body's not just one big eyeball or one big ear walking around on feet. Um, the body is actually, and by the way, some people don't think God has a sense of humor, but really in their day in the Hebrews, uh, just, just accentuating something and making something bigger than it was was their form of humor. So in other words, that was Paul's way of cracking a joke. Um, and so, so God has a sense of humor. And God enjoys people that laugh. How many of you know it's good to laugh every now and then? It's good to even laugh at yourself every now and then. So he said, can you imagine a six-foot eyeball walking around in the church, at least in their day, where they would laugh at that? So Paul's writing that way, and he's saying, look, he said the church is not one big eyeball or one big ear walking around. The church is actually a body. Look at your neighbor and say, you belong in this church. You belong here. You're, you're, you're a part of a church that's really important. Look at someone else and say, you're important. You're important. You're important. Um, you're important. Now listen, it's the devil's business to make you think like you're all alone. And it's even his greater business to make you feel like you don't really have any measurable difference to make you're all by yourself nobody cares and worse than that you don't have anything to add so the apostle paul went on really when you read the book of ephesians he said in the body every joint supplies something in other words every part is important even the parts you can't see are important for the body to do what the body does. Now, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but here's what I'm trying to get across to you today. Sometimes the greatest ministry does not flow from one source in the church. For every need, there is a supply. Every joint is supplying I said, for every need, there is a supply. Here's the one thing I can promise you today. If you came with a need, there's a supply for your need. God wants to meet your need. God wants to supply what's lacking to you. God wants to help you in that way. It cannot happen on your own, you need another member of the body. For every need, there is a supply. For every problem, there is a solution. For every trouble, there is an answer. For every person that comes in with a broken heart, there's healing for that broken heart. For every individual that wonders, do I matter to the Lord? There's an answer to that. Amen. And it doesn't just come through a sermon that the pastor preaches on Sunday morning. It comes when the body becomes the body. It comes when the church becomes the church. We preached a series of messages and we said, just let the church be the church. In other words, it comes when God's Spirit gets involved and God's Spirit energizes and God's Spirit begins to flow. It comes when we start to walk worthy of the, the calling we're with, we're called, as Paul puts it. It comes when we start following as a body the actions of God's Spirit because as we do, people can look at us and they can tell where we're going just because of the fact that there's a whole group of people that are filled with God's Spirit, that are moving in the same direction. There can be all sorts of provisions that come when you're in the church of the living God. Thank the Lord. There's ministry that comes when you come to the church of the living God. Amen. So Paul is writing, and I want you to to see a little bit of background of Philippians because he's in a prison in Rome. He's writing to a church 
in Philippi. And as he's writing this letter, they're sending care packages through a man by the name of Epaphrodites because he's waiting on trial. He's going to appear in Rome. And they're sending him financial help. And so Paul is sending a letter back to them saying, thank you for the help that you've sent to me. But as he's writing back to them, he also says, I'm going to send Timothy to you because Timothy will naturally care for you. In other words, if Timothy comes, it'll almost be like I'm there. Timothy will love you like I love you. Timothy will care for you like I care for you. I know other people are selfish, but Timothy is not selfish. Timothy has the love of God flowing through his life. And he says there's another man by the name of Epaphrodites, and he said he came and he actually risked his life to stand by my side. But I'm believing that I'm going to get out of here soon. But as soon as I know how it will work out for me, then I will let you know. In other words, I don't really know how it's going to turn out for me. But I know that God is still working. And God is still doing some awesome, mighty things. Now listen, if Paul was a negative person, Paul would have said, or if negativity was all over his life, Paul would have said something like this. Paul would have just said, well, isn't it just my luck? I'm just talking about how some people are negative in this world. How many of you know you can't please everybody? For some people, it's too hot. For other people, it's too cold. For other people, it's too soft. And for other people, it's too loud. And there can be negativity that could take over our life. But the Apostle Paul, as he's in prison and he doesn't know how things will turn out for him, he's not saying, oh, please feel sorry for me. He actually has incredible victory in his spirit. And he writes to the church and he says, you know what? Don't be concerned about me. Actually, I'm the one who's concerned about you. And I believe that God is going to do some great things in your life. Now listen, the church is the only organization in this world that exists for its non-members. We're here for people who aren't even here yet. Do you know what's important to God? It's not the pews. It's not the carpet. Lord have mercy because we paid a bunch of money to get it all here. It's not the parking lot. It's not the new organ that we just purchased that Brother Mark just set up in the corner. Thank the Lord for that. Look at that. None of that's important to God. You know what's important to God? The people. I said the people. Paul talked about people because people were important to God. Paul talked about the church in Philippi because the church in Philippi was important to God. Paul talked about Timothy because Timothy was important to God. And Epaphrodites because Epaphrodites was important to God. If, if the Bible would have been written at your time, your name would have been in there. My name would have been in there. Because you and I are important to God. You have a soul that will live somewhere forever. You are eternal. The carpet isn't eternal one of these days. The Bible says this whole world is purified by fire. That means it's going to burn up. My car is not eternal. That means one of these days my car is going to burn up. Maybe I shouldn't be so concerned about it. <laughs> Amen. The, the chair you're sitting on is not eternal. One of these days it's going to burn up. You know what's important? You're important. Because one of these days, you will live somewhere forever. I said forever. Forever. And the church is a forever family. The church is a place where we get to know people that we will be with forever. For eternity. 
There's something inside of you, amen, that never feels younger or older. It's called your soul. It's the real you that's down inside of this skin that I look at all the time. But the real you is in there somewhere, and that's the, that's the part that Jesus died for. That's the part that Jesus went to Calvary and shed his warm blood for. That's what he cares about. He cares about your soul and listen to me he cares too much about your soul to let it shrivel up in the negativity that is in this world he wants to pull you out of that place he doesn't want you to live under the burden and struggle through this world like the world struggles and muddles through he wants you to be an overcomer regardless of the circumstances you live in he wants to teach you and train you and instruct you and show you how to rise above look at your neighbor and say you're going to overcome it you're going to overcome it. I said, you're going to overcome it. But pastor, I don't know how it's going to work out for me. You're going to overcome it. However it works out, you're going to be an overcomer. However it falls out, you're going to be an overcomer. However it, it pans out in the end, you're going to be an overcomer. Pastor, I don't know what's happening in this upcoming year. However this upcoming year comes out, you're going to rise above it. You're going to, you're going to, somehow, you're going to somehow be blessed of God in the middle of it. You're going to come out of it. I'm completely convinced that the opposite of negativity is faith and a heart of thanksgiving. I don't think we can be negative and be full of faith at the same time. I don't think we can be murmuring and complaining and be full of faith at the same time. Lord, have mercy. I believe with all of my heart, God wants to encourage your faith. He wants to help you in that area of your life. So, Paul is saying, I've got all these problems that are facing me. Some real challenges are coming down my road. But I believe somehow God is going to get involved in the situations that we're facing. And so he tells the church in Philippi, God's going to send people to you to help you. That's what he's going to do. God's favorite way of touching people is through other people. I want to read Romans 10, 14, and 15. Paul is the one that writes Romans. By the way, when Paul wrote to the Romans, he didn't think he would come there as a prisoner. He thought he would come there as a minister in Rome. How many of you know life doesn't always work out the way we want it to work out? But Paul, when he's writing this letter, he says, How will they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Now, I read all of that for you to see one word. It's called feet. People have feet. My dog has paws, but he does not have feet like you and I have feet. People have feet. If God is going to touch your life, he's going to use another person to do it. It's his favorite way of touching people. He uses other people to touch people. He doesn't just use anybody. He uses people who are sent. That means they're on a mission to do something that God called them to do. That means God will call someone and send them into your life and that called person that's sent into your life 
will help you in some way. How many of you can say God used a person to get you to where you are in your spiritual journey with the Lord? I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers. I'm thankful for parents. I remember my dad teaching one of my Sunday school classes, and he said, God can look right through that ceiling and look right down into your heart. <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, Lord, have mercy. God's looking through the ceiling right down into my heart right now. <laughs> but when there's a God called teacher... God uses those teachers. When there's a God called preacher, God will use that preacher. But listen to me, I'm not just talking about preachers and teachers just randomly out there. I believe every one of us is called for God's purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. You're called. That's you. That's you. That's you. You're called. You're supposed to be involved in this. So God wants to use people. Amen. So Paul says a number of different things. But he talks about a man by the name of Timothy. And he says concerning Timothy, he said, I'm going to send this man to you because he will naturally care for you. Life is too short to hang out with the wrong people. I've heard it said there's four forces that are at work when you're flying an airplane. There's something called lift, thrust, weight, and drag. And you must account for all four of those forces when you fly in an airplane. How many of you, when you get on an airplane, they weigh your luggage? Everyone gone through that process where they weigh your bags when you get on an airplane? Yeah. I think they should weigh the people. Anyways, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. But here's what you need to know. There's a reason they weigh your bag. You might think it's just so they make more money. I'm sure there's something involved in that, too. But they need to know how much weight is in the airplane before it takes off. There's a reason for that. Because if there's too much weight, there's no way that airplane will be able to take off. It'll pull it back down. Now listen to me. You could say there's four types of people that can come into your life. There's people who are lifters. And when you leave them, you feel better. You got a spring in your step. You feel like you can kind of face the world again. They lift you up wherever they are. They're lifters. There's people who are thrusters and motivators. Just say the word motivators. By the way, an unmotivated life is barely worth living. You need to come to church because you need spiritual motivation. You need something to put a jet pack on your back. <laughs> So that when you leave, you've got some motivation. You're ready to get up and take on a Monday or a Tuesday and get into this week. Because this world is full of weights and drags. It's a place that's full of negativity. And you know what I'm talking about. You meet certain people, and I mean, the goldfish just died. I don't know how many goldfish they have, but they die all the time. They only have four flat tires, but they've had one for three months. And you could say, you could say it's just a drag or it's just a weight. It's a heavy burden. It's a heavy weight. Now listen to me. God is calling you and I, I believe, to get in his presence, to shake off those heavy bands and those heavy chains that's why we've got to get involved in worship and praise. Why? Because it breaks things off of us. It's like a scrubbing that takes place. All the negativity of this world. You come into church with all that negativity. It's like God meets you 
at the place, kind of like they meet you when you go through the airport and he looks through your stuff and he says, this isn't going with you. This has got to stay behind. You've got too much negativity. I'm sorry, but we're keeping this bag. You go on into that place of worship. Many times I say, that's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry your burdens anymore. I heard one person say, well, I'm just down here under all my problems. Well, what are you doing down there under all of your problems? It's time to rise above your problems. It's time to start trusting the Lord and believing the Lord and moving on with Jesus. It's time to lift up your eyes a little bit higher and start trusting God again. It's time for a little bit of faith to come back into your life again. God is going to make a way somehow. And so you could say the church is about lifting and thrusting and pushing you forward. And you need your brothers and sisters. You need a connection to them. You need a few good friends to move forward in the Lord. Amen. And you don't just need anybody. You need someone who's sent into your life. To help you in that way. There's a scripture and it's a great one. And Paul says these words in this scripture. He says in Luke 6, 38. He says, give and it will be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your being. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And I would put it like this many times as preachers. We might use that in taking up an offering. We might say, oh, give, and it will be <laughs> given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. But you know what it really means? What it really means is the way you function and flow in this world will come back to you. If you're someone who isn't selfish, you're selfless, you're concerned about other people, if you cultivate that, that eventually comes back to you. My question to you is, what kind of a church do you want to be a part of? If you want to be a part of a church that's full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, well, then guess what you need to do? You need to get full of faith. You need to get full of the Holy Ghost because we reap what we sow. If we cultivate those seeds, that's what we reap. And the Apostle Paul said, I want you to understand when Timothy comes to you, he's going to love you like other people don't love you because he's been with me for a long time. And I know when he gets there, there's a boiling love from God. There's a liquid love in his heart that it literally will overwhelm everything around it. And there's going to be a touch of God in that church regardless of the problems that's there because Timothy is coming. I love that. Peter, Jesus said, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, of course I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. Do you really love me, Peter? Oh, yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then tend to my people. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Well, then love my people. Love my church. Love the ones that I love. Love the people that I love. You know what changes lives? It's love. Do you know what breaks down barriers? It's love. Do you know how walls fall down? Somebody with the liquid love of Jesus comes into their life and they love them back to where they need to be in God. You can do whatever you want to, but I love you too much to leave you where you are. And here I come. Thank the Lord. And Paul said, if you ever find somebody like that, that's like-minded, that loves people like that, he said, you need to invest in that kind of a relationship. You need to foster that everywhere you go because where the love of God is, when people are connected with the love of God in a church, he said, there I am in the midst of a group like that. I can show up there and I can live there and I'm comfortable there and I work there. So Paul didn't say, I'm sending you the best preacher I know, or I'm sending you the guy that operates in the gifts better than anyone else I know. 
He said, I'm sending you someone that can love people more than anybody I know. There's going to be apostolic ministry when he gets there because he's going to love you to the place where the negative shackles are going to break off of your life and they will never come back. I'm telling you, what's coming to you is a revival of love. And it's going to love people to the point where their lives will be changed. There's something called life-changing love. It doesn't flow from me to you. It flows from Jesus to me. And then it flows to you. It boils out negativity. It gets rid of all that other junk. And when it flows in the church, it does something nothing else can do. Thank the Lord. Pastor, I don't know how it's going to turn out for me. I don't know either. But here's one thing I am going to know. Whatever you're going to go through, you're going to go through it knowing that Jesus loves you. You're going to go through it knowing that Jesus cares about you. You're going to go through it knowing that he wants what's best for you. You're going to get through this because God is going to communicate his love to you somehow. God will find a way. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Paul wasn't a great apostle because Paul was so great. Paul was a great apostle because he was surrounded by a dream team of people. That love people. What made the New Testament church so powerful? How many of you want to go back to the New Testament church? How many of you would like to see signs and wonders and see God just show up and do whatever God wants to do? How many of you would like to live in a place like that? Amen. What was their greatest secret? They loved one another. It's so deep. <laughs> it's so difficult. They actually cared about people. When they said they cared, they really did care. When they said they were praying for you, they really got on their knees and they really were praying for you. When they said they were concerned about you, they really were concerned about you. They really got out of their comfort zone. That's why Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He said, I know you're willing to get out of your comfort zone for me. I know you're willing to walk on water with me, but do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know. And he said, well, then get out of your comfort zone for those that are around you. Then reach out to someone else. Amen. I'll tell you how to be, how to be the, the person that has the worst 2023. Just think about yourself. Just live for yourself. All of 2023, I promise you, here's my promise, you'll have the worst year you've ever had in your life. Right. Just think about your problems. Just think about your struggles. Just think about your issues. Just think about you. Be selfish. That'll give you the worst year you've ever had. I'll tell you how to have the best year you're ever going to have in 2023. First of all, ask the Lord. Say, God, give me love for someone else. Pour it into my spirit, pour it into my life, and help me to see people like you see people. And give me that miracle in this upcoming year. And my promise to you is it'll give you the greatest year you've ever had. Because when you stop thinking about yourself, Paul would have been in a heap of trouble. He would have said, listen, I wanted to come to Rome. I believed if I got to Rome, I could have changed this world. And I wrote this letter to Rome, and I was trying to bring everybody together to create this launching pad to reach the whole world. I had this great scheme and this great plan. But when he got to Rome, he didn't come the way he thought he came. He came as a prisoner, and he was locked up to different people. Every four hours, they would change the guard. And Paul, while he was in prison, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 
and Philemon. He wrote four books in your New Testament while he was in prison. And you could say he wanted something different than what he got. But what he got turned into be his greatest blessing because the world was changed. Because one man said, I'm not going to sit here and soak in bitterness and negativity. I'm going to rise up and believe God for something greater than where I am right now. And that's why he said, I can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I can tell you to rejoice. That's why he can say, look, I can forget about the things that are behind. And I'm pressing to the things that are in front of me. I can reach for the prize of the high calling. He said all these great things. I've got this mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's a lot that can be said in Philippians. But what he's saying here is two things. Number one, he said, listen, if there's someone who really loves you, you need to cultivate the relationship with that person. If someone really cares about you, don't stiff arm them. Don't hold them at arm's length. Let them come into your world and love you. Look at someone right in the whites of their eyes and say, you've got to let someone love you. Tell them, you've got to let someone love you. You've got to let that happen. You've got to open up to what God wants to do. Now listen, I know the students, that might be a joke, but I'm not talking about some random person that you think looks fine or whatever it might be. I'm talking about the love of God <laughs> working in someone's life. Amen. Someone could walk out the door saying, thank the Lord, I finally got my miracle. Pastor just said, I just need to let him love me. <laughs> I better correct it. Amen. But when you look at the Bible, there's two people Paul talked about, Timothy, and then there's a man by the name of Epaphrodites. Now listen, he said, I need someone and in their day they the church in philippi they needed to help the apostle paul because if you sat in prison in their day you'd just die in prison unless someone came to give you food or clothes or whatever so the church in philippi it was 800 miles they had no airplanes they had no cars why does god put this in the bible because one man raised his hand and said i'm willing to take the risk i'm willing to carry money all the way through all the thieves and trouble and dark of night I'm willing to get it to the Apostle Paul. I'm willing to take a chance to minister to him. Why did people take a chance to minister to Paul? Because Paul took a chance when he ministered on other people. You get what you sow. You reap what you sow. How many of you know it takes a chance to minister to people? You can get rejected. You can get looked at like you're foolish. There's a lot of problems that can come when you reach out to minister to someone else. That's true. You take a risk. Here's what I'm going to say next. It's still worth it to take the risk. You're going to love some people and they're going to reject you love anyways. You're going to build some people up, they'll reject you, build them up anyways. You're going to help some people and they won't help you, help them anyways. You're going to love some people, they won't love you, love them anyways. Overcome evil with good. You're going to rise above it. Stand with me if you would. Facing the future with friends. Facing the future with friends. But woven into all of these verses is one more individual. I guess I didn't talk about very much. Two times. Paul said, but I trust Jesus. But my faith is in Jesus. Epaphrodites, one of these days he's going to leave me. I don't know if he'll come back or not. But I still have Jesus. Timothy might walk away from me. I don't know if I'll see him again. But my trust is in Jesus. 
they say every four hours, Paul was chained up to another prisoner. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Somewhere in this little thing, I did the math on that. And basically, he met over 4,000 people during the time he was imprisoned. And my question is, who was the real prisoner? Because at the end of Philippians, he says, even the church in Caesar's own house, they salute you. In other words, the Praetorian Guard themselves, they're converting to Christianity. Because they have to listen to me preach to them. <laughs> when they chain the guard up to me, he has nowhere to go. And Paul says, look at the revival that's taking place. Because of the trouble that I'm in. How do you stop a guy like that? Here's my answer. You don't. You don't. He talks about Timothy. And he says, you should cultivate a relationship with people like that. He talks about people that are willing to take a risk on ministry. And he said, you should hold people like that in honor. You should honor people that take risks, that minister like that. But he says, but my trust, my faith is in Jesus. There's an old song, and it says these words, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the only one who cares and understands Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. And you'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. Woven into the fabric of Philippians chapter 2. You can't see him, but he's there. Standing in the shadows of that prison house was Jesus. Nail-scarred hands standing by the Apostle Paul. And Paul said, I maybe don't have Timothy right now. I maybe don't have Epaphrodites right now. But my faith is in Jesus. Facing the future with friends. Here's my point. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to walk away from you. He's always going to love you. He's always going to care about you. But pastor, this person disappointed me, but Jesus never disappointed me. But pastor, this person walked away from me, but Jesus never walked away from me. But pastor, this person doesn't love me anymore, but Jesus will love you forever and ever and ever. He's not going anywhere. He's going to minister to you. Amen. 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 So if you're here today, here's what I'm really reaching for. Certainly when this service is over, we've got sign-up sheets for reach groups out in the lobby. I mean, there's reasons I'm preaching what I'm preaching, but it's so much more than that. What I'm trying to say is Jesus is in this situation somewhere somewhere in the shadows he's there he's there he said I don't know how it's going to turn out for me but but I trust the Lord Jesus I'm expecting the best I might get the worst but my faith is in Jesus Maybe I'm preaching today and you're saying, but pastor, if you really knew the, the trouble and the negative things that are surrounding my life, you wouldn't be able to preach that way. I don't know it all. But Jesus, Jesus was there when it happened. Jesus knows where all the broken pieces are. And standing somewhere, in the shadows you're going to find him he's going to walk up and down the aisles of this church he's going to walk in and out among the people 
and he's going to come with healing in his hands and he's going to help you he's going to find a way to stand by your side in the place that seems so lonely and speak hope and help into your life amen amen if this is talking to you in any way I want you to come and just stand across the front of this church if God is just working in you in some way just practical ways I want you to come and maybe you don't feel comfortable coming that's okay too it's whatever if you for whatever reason wherever you are have this feeling today that Jesus is going to come out of some shadowy place and make himself just very real to you. That's just my prayer. So let's pray that. And then let's just minister to one another. The Lord might send someone to you to just pray with you. Jesus, in your name, Lord God, you know the challenges. You know where we're living. You know that we need to be loved and we need to be encouraged and you know that we need to be helped. And yet we also know you're going to send people. I want to be a part of that process. But Lord Jesus, if today I can't see where the help is coming from, I pray that there would be a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we would be able to see you encourage someone's faith. Lift them today, Lord. And turn me into an element, Lord God, that can come into their life like a band-aid. And help them to be healed and to be made whole again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Our church, pray for a while. If you need to pray alone, that's fine. But if the Lord leads you, I want you to go and pray with someone. If that's what the Lord's leading you to do. But let's pray. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Aren't we so glad that Jesus Christ is here in this room today with us today? I'm so glad I feel the peace and the joy and the love of Jesus Christ in this place. 
Let's pray a prayer of dismissal. If you're praying, keep praying. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord God, for being here. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for breaking every chain. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the peace. Thank you, O oh God, for the, the joy of the Lord. Your joy is our strength today, O oh God. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that your love, your joy, your peace uh, would go with us as we leave this place. Uh, we are bound together, Lord Jesus. We are part of the body of Christ. Uh, we're with one another. Help us, Lord Jesus, to reach out to one another this week, O oh God. Uh, check up on one another, to love on one another, O oh God. Uh, help us to leave this place and never forget the word that you have spoken into our spirit today. Help us, oh God, to love one another, oh God. Bless us, oh God, today as we go. Bless us in our going. Bless us in our workplace and our schools today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.